And Brother Chris, he's a chaplain with the Air Force. He's an educator in Holmes County. He's a teaching pastor there at Chipley. And I appreciate his dedication to God's Word. Uh, he has dedicated himself to the study of God's Word and the preaching of God's Word. And we appreciate his uh, ministry. I know my my life has been, been impacted by his ministry. We appreciate it. Amen. You. Let's give him a hand. Once again, and uh, I was thinking, and Brother Chris and I were talking as I as I for service, and just how much God's doing down here. And it's really beautiful to see what God's doing in Vernon, and uh, God's plans and purposes for this community. And it's beautiful to see what God's doing in each person's life. And what we always have to be careful of is that we remember. We remember, that's an important word, and yes. we remember the source of our beauty. Yes. And so that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. I'm going to be in Ezekiel chapter 16. I want to give y'all just a just a little while to get there, and I'm going to give you some of this water. You're very honored to be here. Ezekiel chapter 16. That song was beautiful too, brother. They all, all the songs were beautiful, that last one. I can remember as a young boy, my mom just crying to the old rugged cross. She gave her heart to Jesus later in her life. But that song, I remember, she cried every time it was sang. And let, let's look. We're, we're made beautiful because of God's covenant of grace. There's one thing that makes us beautiful. There's one thing that accomplishes God's work in our life, and it's His grace. Let's always be careful to focus on that. Let's look at Ezekiel. I want to read chapter 4 through 14. As for your nativity in the day that thou was born, your navel was not cut, neither were you washed in water to supple thee. Thou were not salted at all, nor swaddled at all. No, I pitied you to do any of these things unto you, to have compassion upon you. You were cast out in the open field to the loathing of your person, in the day that thou wast born, and when I passed by thee, I saw thee polluted in thine own blood, and I said unto thee, When thou wast in thy blood, live. Yea, I said unto thee, When thou wast in thy blood, live. I have caused thee to multiply as the bud of the field, and thou hast increased and waxed great, and you are come to excellent ornaments. Your breasts are fashioned, and your hair is grown, whereas you walk naked and bare. Now when I passed by you and looked upon thee, behold, uh, your time was the time of love. And I spread my skirt over you and covered your nakedness. Yea, I swear unto thee and entered into a covenant with thee, saith the Lord God, and thou becamest mine. Then I washed thee with water. Yea, I thoroughly washed away the blood from thee and I anointed thee with oil and I clothed thee also with broidered work and shod thee with badger skin, and I girded about uh, thee with fine linen and covered you with silk. I decked you also with ornaments, and I put bracelets upon your hands and chain on your neck, and I put a jewel on thy forehead and earrings on thy ears and a beautiful crown upon thine head. Thus were you decked with gold and silver and thy raiment was a fine linen and silk and embroidered work. Thou didst eat fine flour and honey and oil, and thou wast exceeding beautiful, and thou didst prosper into a kingdom. And thy renown went forth among the heathen for your great beauty, for it was perfect through my comeliness, which I had put upon thee, saith the Lord. God bless you as you're seated. Now, I'm going to ask y'all to pray with me real quick. And God would just speak to us and open up our hearts. Help me to preach this morning and help us to hear it. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, thank you for this beautiful time. God, what a beautiful service. What beautiful fellowship, God. What beautiful work you're doing, Lord. What a beautiful, uh, mighty God you are, Lord. Help us, Father, today to focus upon the source of our beauty. God, help me to speak and help me to... Uh, be anointed, God, as I do so, Lord. Touch our hearts, God. Speak to our inner man. And God, help us to recall and remember all the great things you have done. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. A little history on Jerusalem, the city of David. Wasn't always the city of the great king. You know, when Jerusalem was founded, 
Jerusalem was a city that was off the trade routes. It was a city that was difficult to defend. It was not a very sought after city. And as soon as Jerusalem was founded, it was also become desolate. It was, there was no worth found in that city. Just like that's the reason the Lord begins to speak to his, his, his people, Israel. And he tells them, for your nativity, the day you were uh, born, your navel was not even cut. You were not even washed. You know, those are the first thing that happened to a child when they're born. I remember when my son was born, we cut his umbilical cord. They immediately washed him, wrapped him up. You know, they didn't just leave him uh, naked, didn't just leave him in his, in, his, in his filth and all that kind of stuff. They took care of him and nourished him. But see, Jerusalem, when it was founded, Jerusalem, again, was a city. It was not on an established trade route, so therefore it had no economic value. It was hard to defend, therefore it had no military value. And so Jerusalem was discarded just as quickly as it was founded. And that's what the Lord's reminding his people. And he's using the city of Jerusalem to remind them. Jerusalem's often uh, uh, viewed as a, as a woman. And during this time period in history, what was really sought after were strong male babies for future soldiers. That's the reason why the Lord's talking to his people. And he said just as soon as she was founded, she was cast away because she had no in, uh, apparent value to those that found her. And aren't we all that way? We were born into this world. Now I love my son, but spiritually speaking, we are all born. My first thought today, why must we remember the source of our beauty? Because this world left us naked, orphaned, and dying. You look in verse four, as for thy nativity, the day that you were born, your navel was not cut. Neither were you washed with water to supple. You weren't handled tenderly, gently. You were not washed. There was no salt. Salt was used. There's debatable as to why salt was used, but certainly for medical and uh, uh, cleanliness purposes. You were not swaddled. No, I pitied you. Y'all, that's, when we look at the state of Jerusalem, that's the state that God found her in. And it's not so different from the spiritual condition that we all existed in. It doesn't take long to realize that this world is a cold, hard place that does not care about people's well-being. That's right. It, it, as with Jerusalem in relationship to God, we were desolate. We were naked. We were filthy and we were dying. We were orphans. That's what God saw. And I would like to share a few verses that illustrate this fact. Revelation 3.18, this is the letter to the church at Laodicea. Jesus said, I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich. White raiment so that you may clothe yourself and that the shame of your nakedness shall not be revealed. And I sound to anoint your eyes that you may see. And in regards to filthiness, the Lord says, although you wash yourself, Jeremiah 2.22 would lie and use much soap, the stain of your iniquity is before me declares the Lord. I, I, how many of y'all remember a time in your life when there was something about you that was dirty and you knew it, but soap wouldn't wash it off? You remember there was like an inner filth and even if you got a shower, you still felt dirty. What is that? That spiritual filth. The only thing that can wash that off a person's life is the blood of Jesus yeah. Christ. Yeah. That's what yeah. cleanses us. It's not soap. It's not water. It is the blood of Jesus. And that's what the Lord was saying to his people all the way back through Jeremiah. And concerning orphans, this is we're all we we're all born spiritual orphans without a spiritual father until we were born again. But the Lord says this, for in you the fatherless find compassion. You know, I could go on and on. There's a lot of verses that indicate uh, our condition, how God views our condition. But the point is, without God, we're all in this state. We are all poor, blind, orphaned, and naked. That's what we are spiritually. While we all agree with this, it is very easy to forget this. We live in a society where we have a lot of our needs met. I know we complain about America and the direction she's going in, but we have it very good compared to other countries. In uh, Haiti alone, the average annual, they, they live off of less than 1200 dollars a year y'all that ain't a lot of money that is not a lot of money and so we are very rich in this country 
the, the lowest income in here is rich compared to the people who live in other parts of this world. And in a country like this where needs are met, uh, it's easy to forget our deep spiritual needs that we have. In Revelation 3.17, that's what Jesus told the church. You say I'm rich, and you increase with goods and have need of nothing, and you don't know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. That's what Jesus said to the church, and that's all of us. So, Brother Chris, how do I know this about myself? Well, we just simply need to seek God to recognize our daily need for His grace and mercy. Amen. You know, God's not looking at you today saying you're you're wretched. No, if you if you're in Christ, you're you you've been clothed, you've yeah. been redeemed, yeah. you've been adopted. But what must we do? We must not forget that because because God did that, we had a need for that, and so we can't forget the great need that God filled. But it's easy to do that sometimes when we focus on all that we do have. As, as ask God to show areas of your life that are lacking. Do not assume because God has done so much that there's still not great work left to accomplish. Guys, none of us are there yet. Even the Apostle Paul said, the, the great apostle of the faith said, I have not yet attained perfection. But this one thing I do, I press onward to the mark of the high calling in Christ. If you've been saved, you are none of these things anymore. You're not poor, miserable, blind, and naked. But don't forget who, who came in and redeemed your situation. Ask God to remind you constantly what he's done for you today. Today, these songs, remembering the old rugged cross, guys, yes. remembering in order for us to be made beautiful, Jesus had to be made ugly. Jesus had to be made unrecognizable. He came into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, not riding upon that white horse that many view this kingly Messiah, this warrior king to ride in, although he rode in on a donkey and not just that, a, 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 a colt. You see, that's what Jesus did. Why? Because he was coming in and, and his week would only get worse. And so he became ugly so that you and I might become beautiful. And we just have to remember that. And when we think about it, listen, why must we remember the source of our beauty? Because number two, God passed by us in compassion. When we think of God's response to man's condition, y'all, think about this. We think about God's wrath, his judgment, and his dissatisfaction with man. But how many of you know God's response to man's condition is compassion? Yes. You see, yes. Jesus is God's response to man's condition. Those who reject Jesus will experience God's wrath, God's judgment, and his anger. But initially, he wants compassion. In verse 5 through 14, I won't read all those again, but they detail God's compassionate response to Jerusalem's condition. God responded this way to Jerusalem because he is a God of compassion. That song I love, and I, I don't have it memorized, but when we oftentimes think of the way God should respond to us, many of you this morning may uh, have not come to God when you knew you needed to because you didn't know how God would respond to your sin. Maybe you didn't know how God would respond to your situation. And when you came, you were surprised to see that he was a God of compassion. Yes. He was a God of love. He didn't deal with your sins the way you thought he was going to or even the way you deserve for him to. He's a God of compassion. He is a God that wants to not just see needs. God sees everything. He is a God who first sees and then he does. He, he sees our needs and he works to meet those needs, not because we are worthy, but because he is intrinsically compassionate. That's who he is. He doesn't just show compassion. He is compassion. Yes, he doesn't just extend love. He is love. Yes. And that's why everything God does, he does because of who he is. He sees a need. He meets a need. Let's look at that word compassion because Vernon has been very compassionate uh, Grace Assembly and Vernon has been compassionate to this community. God has been compassionate to us. Listen to what that word compassion means. It is a, a word that has been around since around the 14th century. And it comes ultimately from the Latin calm and patty, meaning to bear or suffer. It implies pity with an urgent desire to give aid and spare someone of their trouble. So compassion is not just seeing needs and feeling needs, but it's also doing our best to meet those needs. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That is compassion is what that is, y'all. 
D.L. Moody shared a story of compassion. Now, D.L. Moody, um, of course, famous evangelist of the uh, last part of the 1900s, he says when he was in Boston, he used to attend Sunday school class. And one day he remembered his teacher coming around a counter of a shop. Now, he used to sell shoes, D.L. Moody did. And he said, he put his hand upon my shoulder and he began to uh, talk about Christ and my soul. He said, up until this point, I didn't even know I had a soul. But then I said to myself, this is a very strange thing. Here is a man who never saw me till lately, and yet he is weeping over my sins, and I have never shed one tear about it. But I understand it now, and I know what it is to have compassion for men's soul and to weep over sins. I don't remember what he said, but I can still feel the power of this man's hand on my shoulder tonight. Wow. And you know, you may not remember every aspect of what people say or what God even said to you, but you can remember his compassion. And this community, they're not, listen, people aren't going to remember every word I ever spoke from a pulpit or from a a podium or what have you, but they will remember if I showed them love and compassion. Those are the things that will go far beyond the words I ever speak, the words we ever speak, is can they remember the feeling they had when they were around us? I cannot remember everything the evangelist said the night I was saved. It was a very unconventional service, but what I can remember is just how loving and compassionate God was towards me that night. I don't even remember what the message was all about, but I certainly remember the way God made me feel. Yes. And how true is this? Not only should we see, some of you say, Brother Chris, how can I remember how compassionate God's been to me? I dare say it is a, as you show compassion to other people, that is a very strong reminder of how compassionate He's been for you. So don't just seek to recall God's compassion on you, but also seek to share that compassion with others. You know, an old Chinese proverb says this, that a bit of fragrance always clings to the hand of the one who gives roses. And how true is this? We never, ever touch a life without touching our own. Amen. 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 You'll never show compassion without experiencing the compassion of God. And one way to remember God's compassion for you is by extending that compassion to others. There's nothing that opens up our heart to receive God's compassion like giving God's compassion, being compassionate. And we must remember our source of beauty because number three, God is the one who speaks life over us. Listen to what the Lord said in verse 6 and 7 again, and I just for the sake of time. He said, when I passed by you, I saw you polluted in your own blood. I want you to think of it after a baby's born. As if they, this very dirty situation, polluted. That's the imagery here of Jerusalem. The Lord said, I passed over you. When you're, you were desolate, when you were rejected and abandoned, I passed over you. You were in your blood. You were dying. You think about a child who's abandoned long enough, they're not going to live very long. And that's the imagery here that, that the Lord is showing his people. I passed by you in your blood. I passed by you when you were ready to die. You were in your filth. You were abandoned. And I said what? I said live. It's the Lord that speaks life over. So listen to what Ephesians 2, 4, and 5 says. Ephesians 2, 4, and 5 states, But God, I can't think of two more hopeful words in all the Scripture, right? But God. You did all this but God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins. He has quickened us, made us alive together with Christ for by grace you are saved. But before this quickening, just like Ezekiel described the uh, people of God, we were desolate, dirty, naked, abandoned. We were orphaned in our spirit. We were spiritually fatherless. This is the spiritual state of every human being born into this world. Romans 5, 12 states that, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. You and I, we, we were condemned by birth. We were born sinners. And, and, and if that weren't enough, we chose to sin. So we are sinners by birth. We are sinners by choice. And it is only through the second birth that uh, in the new life of God that you and I can be made alive. This is a doctrine called regeneration. The Holman Bible defines regeneration. 
as the radical spiritual change in which God brings an individual from a condition of spiritual defeat and death to a renewed condition of holiness and spiritual life. The biblical doctrine of regeneration emphasizes God's role in making spiritual change possible. This is not something we can work at. I cannot save people. I cannot. God can speak life over you this morning. If someone's in here this morning and you're spiritually dead, you have never been spiritually adopted into the family of God. You have never had the filth of your first birth wiped away from you, the sin, the stain, the abandonment. You're here this morning. God wants to speak life over you. In that Hallelujah. Condition. He doesn't want you to uh, get better than that condition. That's the condition he saves us in. Some people think I got to just get better. I got to clean my life up. No, God cleans us up. Amen. He speaks life Amen. over us. Yeah. He He takes us as babies. And he He wraps us in His grace, His love, and He cleanses us and He takes care of us. And guys, He's the only one that can do that. If I'm waiting to get cleansed, and I'm expecting the world to cleanse me, so God will accept me. The world left us like that. That's right. The world left us in this abandoned, dirty, orphan, dying state. It's only God who found us in His great love and mercy and said, "Live." Is there anyone in here this morning that hears the voice of God telling you to live this morning? Amen. I pray someone hears the voice of God today. But listen to this. And you know, my my. Childhood pastor and mentor brother Ed Bell always told me, Chris, you can never be mad at a blind man for being blind. He said, but you can be aggravated at someone who can see for acting blind. Yeah. But yeah. Matthew 9, 16, 17, John 12, 37, here are some verses, but there's a, there's a, 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 a description here in this book, an anthropologist on Mars, neurologist, Oliver Sacks tells about Virgil, a man who has been blind from early childhood. When he was 50, Virgil underwent surgery and was given the gift of sight. But as he and Dr. Sachs found out, having the ability uh, and the capacity for sight is not the same thing as seeing. Virgil's first experiences with sight were confusing. He was able to make out colors and movements, but arranging them into coherent pictures was more difficult. Over time, he learned to identify various objects, but his habits, his behaviors, were still those of a blind man. And Dr. Sands asserts one must die as a blind person to be born again as a seeing person. It is the interim, the limbo, that's so terrible. And y'all, for us to truly see Jesus and his truth, it means more than just observing what he said and what he did. It means having a change of identity. It means that you and I no longer live like a blind man or woman. We no longer live as people who can't see the kingdom of God. We find this often. And when we are resurrected out of the state we're in, we are truly able to look back and realize where we were and where we are and how far God is taking us. And when we would never blame, again, a blind man for blindness. People who don't know Jesus can't know Jesus. People who don't know God cannot see his kingdom. They cannot understand his principles. They cannot follow him. That's right. But you and I have the ability to be born again. John 3, 3 states, Jesus talking to Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a good man. He was a religious man. He was uh, on the Sanhedrin. He was a very powerful religious leader in Jerusalem. He came to Jesus and he asked him, uh, you know, uh, this, that, Jesus stops him in his tracks and he says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And so my question to you this morning is, are you born again? When did God speak life into you? When did life enter you? I'm not simply talking about a change of behavior. I love when people uh, act right and live right. But salvation is more than acting right and living right. Amen. Salvation is a spiritual rebirth. I'm not asking if you quit smoking, drinking, being immoral, or being mean, but are you born again? That's the question. Leonard Ravenhill said Jesus did not come to make uh, bad men good. He came into the world to make dead men live. That's what Jesus came to do. Are you trying to be good or have you been made alive from the spiritually dead? Has God found you in your orphan, naked, dirty state and said, live, live in his love? 
Examine your heart today, Brother Chris. How do, how do I know? Well, examine your heart. Are you spiritually alive? Do you have a relationship with Jesus? Do you have a relationship with Jesus? Do you have a current and living relationship with God? Have you experienced his love? Do you remember when he found you an orphan in your sins, in your filth, in your nakedness, and he changed that? Do you know this has happened to you? It's very easy. Do you desire the things of God? Are you, cons are you just content with the bare bones of religion? Are you still desolate, naked, dirty, dying spiritually? We've got to constantly examine our heart. Yes. I'm the first one. I've got to constantly examine my heart. Yes. Amen. I, I can present this to you today, but only you can apply this. I pray you apply it. 2 Corinthians 13, 5 admonishes us to ex examine yourselves. Whether you be in the faith, prove your own selves. Know you not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobate. Just examine your heart this morning. Do you remember when he came to you and said, live, live in your state? Because we cannot forget the source of our beauty because the, my fourth thought is that God is the one who washed away our filthiness. Yeah. Can you say amen to that? God yeah. washed yeah. away yeah. that yeah. stain of guilt. I couldn't put my finger on it, but one day I just felt guilty on the inside. One day I just felt dirty on the inside. I couldn't understand it. I couldn't. I couldn't put my finger on it, but God knew that it was a spiritual filthiness. It was the filthiness of sin and that he alone could wash that. Listen to what Proverbs 30, 20 says. There is a generation that is pure in its own eyes, yet it is not washed from its own filth. Don't be pure in your own eyes. That's, that's God's word to you this morning. Isaiah 4, 4 says, When the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion, and shall have purged the blood of Jerusalem from the midst thereof by the spirit of judgment, by the spirit of burning. Now these two verses contrast one another. Proverbs 30, 20, there is a self-righteous people who are clean in their own eyes. In Isaiah 4, 4, there is a people for whom God has made righteous through cleansing. Albeit the cleansing comes through judgment at the end of the age, but it just goes to show you there are a people who think they're clean, and there are a people who allow God to clean them. Yes, that's I right. want you to be this morning people who allow God to clean yes. them. Yes. Amen. Don't be Amen. clean in your own eyes. For some of us, that's hard to do. I didn't live a very, very good life before Jesus. It was hard to really make a case for me. But there's been times since I've been a Christian that I begin to think, you know what? I've come a long way. Yeah. I've come a long way. And I have to still be careful of that, even if, even if someone in my position. But I simply use these verses to illustrate the fact that some are cleansed by God and some do not receive God's cleansing because of their own self-righteousness. What did King David say? What was his cry? Psalm 51, wash me. Wash me and I'll be whiter than snow. What did John the Baptist do? He was washing people. What, what, did, what did Jesus say to Peter? Unless I wash you. You have no part in me. And so without our being washed clean by the blood of Jesus, we'll die in our sin. There's no, there's no other remedy. There's no other cure. Jesus knew that when he entered Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. He knew that the blood that would flow from that body in a week is the only thing that would redeem man's soul. Amen. Look no further than Jesus' parable of, of himself to the publican. When we, whenever, whenever we preach, no matter what, there's always about four people in every congregation. I'm not saying all of, all of you have to be here today, but typically there's four kind of people that exist. Those who have been cleansed. How many of you know you've been cleansed by the blood of Jesus? Amen. Amen. There are those who think they are clean in themselves. There are those who recognize their need for God to cleanse them. Though you haven't been cleansed, you know you need to be. And then there are those who feel too dirty to be clean. We were all too dirty to be clean in our own ability. We, we serve a God who majors in the impossibilities. He takes, you say, Brother Chris, I don't have anything. I can't do anything. I can't go anywhere. I can't say anything. You're a prime candidate for God to use. Yeah. Amen. You're a prime candidate. It's those who think they can and have a problem receiving the grace of God. But I want you to look no further than the Pharisee and the publican. Mm -hmm. You haven't done too much this morning for God to cleanse you. You haven't. You, you somehow haven't in the last 200 years been the worst kind of human that the blood somehow isn't powerful enough to cleanse y'all. Right. Think about it. That's right. Think about it. You have people, you have, you have serial killers who are born again believers today reaching people for Jesus. 
That that's there's nobody he can't reach. Amen. And that's just me trying to pull a, an example out of out of thin air. If you've not been that, well, obviously there's people who have done more than you that have experienced the grace of God. And so that's got to get out of our mind. There was something said earlier that really, really drove that point home. And I think that's why I'm even thinking about it right now. But Luke 18, 10 and, 10 and 14, this is the parable of the publican, which was a tax collector. And y'all think about this. We, if you were a tax collector in, in Israel, in Jerusalem, you were the lowest kind of low because you, number one, were a Jew who collected taxes for Rome and your salary was based upon overcharging the Jews and then keeping the rest for yourself. Can you imagine how hated a tax collector was, a publican in Jerusalem? All right, and then you were hated, so the worst thing you could be called during Jesus' time was a tax collector. You call me anything but a tax collector. All right? That was the worst thing you could be called. And I'm serious. But check this out. Two men went up into the temple to pray, Luke 18. The one a Pharisee, very religious, religious leader. The other a publican or a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. God, I thank thee that I am not like other men are. Extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even this publican. And what he was saying is all these, and if, it, if it's not worse, even this publican. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not even lift so much of his eyes unto heaven and spoke himself on the breast. Say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this Hallelujah. man went out of the house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalts himself shall be humbled, and everyone that humbles himself shall be exalted. And we can apply this to our yeah. lives by simply remaining humble and close to God. Yes. You can be humble without being humble. You can literally, you can stay close to God and stay humble by staying close to God. Be like this publican. Not, not in the, you don't have to be a cheating, lying tax collector. That's not what I'm saying. But be like the publican in the sense that you realize you have nothing to offer God. There you go. Amen. And that you don't even, you're not even, it's not, you're not even worthy to look towards heaven because of what you've done and who you are. And that's the kind of people God justifies. God doesn't owe us anything because of what we do. I can fast two times a week and pay my tithes. I'll tell you what, that Pharisee's a lot better than I am if that's how you judge things. Because I don't always fast two days a week. I don't know, you know what I mean? I try to pay my tithes, but I, 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 don't, I don't always check every box every time I'm supposed to. And so if, if, if our salvation was based upon whether or not we're checking all these boxes, all these spiritual boxes, we're in trouble. But if our yeah. salvation is based upon the fact that we realize that in and of ourselves we have nothing to offer God and that He alone can save us, that He alone can redeem us and help us and change yeah. us, then you and I are going to find ourselves justified, we're going to find ourselves changed, and we're going to find ourselves being very usable for God and His kingdom. Because lastly, and I want to conclude with this final thought, we must remember the source of our beauty, praise God, because God is the one who makes all things beautiful. Amen. Ecclesiastes 11, 13, 11, 3 and 11 says this, he has made everything beautiful in his time. He has set the world, that means eternity, in their hearts so that no man can find out the work that God makes from the beginning to the end. It is safe to say that God does beautiful work. Amen. Yes, he does. It, 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 it's, it's so funny to me. My son likes lights. He points at lights, and he would have a blast up here this morning if he pointed stuff. But he loves the stars, and I always carry him out there at night and I tell him God created those God created you and he loves you more than the stars you know what I mean mm -hmm. but God it's it's beautiful I look at the stars of the sky and it's beautiful work I look at my son that's beautiful work you and I can do not have to look far to see God's beautiful work Amen. we don't have to look far to see man's defiling touch upon that work it's corrupting touch even but it is God who makes things beautiful, and that includes you this morning. That's right. What God declares beautiful is not always what man declares beautiful. You see, God's view of beauty is true. God, of his son, he said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. That was how God viewed his son. 
the world viewed Jesus as crucified. Mm -hmm. They took what was beautiful to God and they tried to destroy him. But Psalm 24, 7 says this, One thing I have asked from the Lord that I shall seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. Amen. God Amen. makes everything beautiful. You know why? Because God is beautiful. Yeah. David says, so I may meditate on his beauty, that I may see his beauty. God makes everything good. If you have been born again this morning, the most beautiful thing that could ever happen has happened in your life. You have the life of Jesus Christ birthed on the inside of you. And what God's doing in you is beautiful. Do you always look beautiful outwardly? Do you always get everything right? Probably not. I know I, know I don't. But here's the thing, what God's doing in you is beautiful. Romans 8, 29, part A says, For whom he did foreknow, he did also predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. If Jesus is beautiful, and he is, yes. the most beautiful life that was ever lived, the most beautiful thing, God is beautiful, Jesus is God. If Jesus is beautiful, and if we are being conformed to that image, then we are becoming beautiful. As we have established, God is beautiful because he's conforming you and I. And here's what I think Satan does. He's, he's a master at this. Satan is a master at getting God's people who have truly been born again to focus not on what God is making beautiful, but on what is ugly in their own life. And we'll focus more on the ugly. We'll focus more on the for things that have been forgiven. We'll focus more upon the things that have been cleansed. God's not focusing on those things, by the way. God is focusing on his beloved son in whom he's well pleased. And as that life is being conformed in you and me, that is what God sees. That's what Paul, the apostle Paul was a murderer, y'all. He was what we would consider a terrorist of his time. He sought to destroy the church of Jesus Christ, and then he became born again on the road to Damascus. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine if Paul would have focused on all the ugly things about his former life, Paul would have never been the man of God that God called him to be. Right. And so you need to stop focusing on all the ugly things that God has A, forgiven, that God has changed, or that he is changing, and focus upon that beautiful work that he has put in there. It's that work. Paul said, I've not yet obtained perfection. That's, that's moral. That's Paul. I'm not a perfect man. But this one thing I do, I press onward. Why? Because there's a beautiful work going on. There's something bigger than me. There's something, there's something going on that's greater than anything worth looking back to. And I want to encourage y'all this morning, focus upon the beauty of what God's doing in your life. Some in here today are proud of where God has brought you. You should be. And some of you can only dream of where he will bring you. It's easy because it's human nature to revert back to old ways of thinking. I do it all the time. But it's easy, as it was with the people of Ezekiel, to begin to trust in your God-given beauty. God is making you beautiful. But don't begin to trust in that beauty. You continue to trust in the one who's making you beautiful. That's what God's word to Israel was. I found you when you were nothing. I found you when nobody found any value in you. Not only were you invaluable to the world, you were not even valuable enough to cleanse, to take care of in your infant stages, but I found you in your blood and I said, yeah. And so we don't need to necessarily focus on all the ugly and nasty in our life, but don't ever forget where God found us either. Amen. All right, it's perspective. I'm, I'm thankful for all God's done in my life. I just don't want to forget that it's God that's doing it and has done it. Amen. So I'm thankful if my life is, is, is glorifying to God, I, I, that's the goal. That is the goal. But at the same time, I want to make sure that he continues to get the glory for all the beautiful things he's done. I'm not for a moment trying to discourage any of us to, to not think about the great things he's done. But just do not turn away, uh, you know, be, do not begin to turn what God has done into a boast of your own worth and beauty. This is what Jerusalem did. This is what got Jerusalem in trouble. It was because they forgot their beauty came from God, and they forgot that without God they would have died in a field naked, dirty, and desolate. 
So possibly the most important takeaway, I think today, three things if I could leave you with. Don't forget the source of your beauty. God made you beautiful. And if you're not born again this morning, God can do a beautiful work in your life yes. today. Amen. And you can see God glorified through your life. You've not done too much for God to change. Listen, God breathed the universe into existence. Nothing you've done is too great for him to work in, I promise you. But here's the thing. Don't forget the source of your beauty. Don't trust your beauty alone. Don't trust your beauty alone because we'll be quick to realize that I'm not beautiful without him. If I begin to think I'm something when I'm not, God is very good at reminding us of what we really are. But he wants us to continue to focus upon the source of that beauty. And lastly, remember, how can we come in here and just worship God with our whole heart? We remember where we were when the Lord passed by us. There's an old song that says he's passing by this moment. I want to tell you, when the Lord passes by, it's in compassion. If he's in here this morning, if he's speaking to your heart, it's because he wants to be compassionate upon you. And can you feel the Lord this morning in his compassion trying yes. to deal with your heart? Amen. Trying to do something beautiful in your life? A couple of things. Brother Greg, you play what's ever on your heart, brother. I love that last song y'all did, by the way. If, 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 you, if you don't mind, if you can, brother, I'll play that one as well. But here's my question to us as I close out this morning. Are you still without God? Now, I'm not talking about are you in church? Are you going to church? That's great, by the way. But are you without God? Have you? Has he adopted you? Has he found you in the place you're in? And has he said live? Has he picked you up and washed you off and loved you and gave you new life? Number two, can you tell this morning that he's trying to pass by you in compassion? Thirdly, do you need him to speak life into you today? Are you tired of feeling morally and spiritually filthy? Brother Chris, I know I'm called to live differently. This, is why, this ain't why, you know, this isn't why God created me to live in this. And while a lot of people wouldn't openly admit it here on a Sunday morning, you know in your heart if, if, if this applies to you that things are right. But there is a fountain that's filled with blood that flowed from Emmanuel's veins. And that song says, sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. And that can be you this morning. Yes. God can pick you up, wash you off, and call you son, call you daughter. He's not just going to call you friend, servant. He's going to call you son or daughter. Amen. When that woman had that issue of blood, I want you to think about this. She was bleeding for 12 years. There was a medical issue. That made her unclean and unfit for society. She was an outcast. But you see, when she came to Jesus, she pushed her way. She broke laws, by the way. She broke laws to get to Jesus. And she pushed her way, and she got it. She said, if I could just touch the hem of his garment. To her, the hem of his garment was sufficient, and it was sufficient. But I want you to look at what Jesus called that woman who had lived for 12 years in filth, in blood, in total exile and excommunication. Jesus looked down to her and did not call her woman, he said, daughter, daughter, your faith has made you whole, daughter. Some of you this morning need God to pronounce over your life, son or daughter. Yes. Your faith has made you whole. Have you forgotten, lastly, the one who made you beautiful? Are you trusting in your own beauty? It's so easy to do. Here's what I want us to do. I want us to just examine our hearts for just a moment as Brother Greg sings. And I want to encourage y'all to worship God. Worship the source of our beauty. Worship the one who makes all things beautiful in his time. If you're here today, if I could quickly just ask you, if you're here today and you said, Brother Chris, I'm not a son, I'm not a daughter of God. I'm still out there naked, blind, abandoned, and orphaned. But I want to get my life right with God today. I want my heart to feel clean. I want to know that I'm in relationship with God. Would you just, I'm going to count to three. And when I get to three, would you just slip up your hand so I can see it? I can pray with you this morning.